Thanks, Chad. Well, first of all, I want to say it's a, it's a group effort. The organizers, IPAM, and many people beyond the organizing group as well, the co-organizing group as well. So thank you, everyone. Um, right, so the title really should be Multimodal Transit Systems Network Design and Starting to Think About Equity Considerations, <laughs> really. Uh, I'm by no means an equity uh, expert. Uh, recently, I've been thinking a lot about transit systems, and that's led to thinking more about equity considerations and, um, you know, a somewhat selfish effort to bring a group of people together uh, to learn more about equity. So with that, I'll, I'll talk a, a bit about the design of transit systems and you know, what implications that might have for equity and how we might try to do it better. Um, OK, so this is maybe kind of obvious to most of you. Why should we force, focus on mass transit-centric solutions? So there is a big focus on ride-hailing systems. Uh, and uh, the question is, well, is, is ride hailing good? Is, is that going to help solve our problems in mobility? Uh, one of the fundamental challenges in ride hailing is this notion of deadheading or rebalancing, right? So for every mile you travel as a traveler, the vehicle is traveling more than a mile. And, uh, and the data we have, of course, there is not great data on this because, again, we talked about data a lot. There's not a lot of public access to this kind of data. Uh, the general rough numbers from major metropolitan areas in the U.S. at least is that you know, it's something like for every mile traveled, the vehicle, passengers traveling, the vehicle is traveling about 1.6 miles. Okay. Uh, and of course, what this means is that you know, you, the, the network externality is greater than driving your own car. Right? There are, of course, lots of other benefits. I'm not saying ride hailing is bad, but if you just look at the network uh, externality caused by the, the system, it's, it's worse than driving your own car. Because if you drive your own car, maybe you, there's some overhead for parking, but it's not 60%. Right? And what this means also is that there's an additional congestion, emissions, and also impacts on mass transit, because the buses are now slowed down. Uh, resources might be diverted from uh, public transit uh, to other uh, aspects of infrastructure. And there are obviously some equity considerations. And one other thing that's important here is that when you have a system with multiple ride-hailing uh, services, so let's say Uber and a Lyft, the fragmentation of the market also causes additional inefficiency. So, so this, this, this can be quantified and uh, can hurt more. Now, um, the technology itself is not a problem, right? So we, we need to innovate. Uh, new technology has benefits. We can do things more efficiently with new technology. The question is, how do we utilize it in a way that's more sustainable, scalable, and equitable? And the first obvious step that you know, every, many places have tried to do is to say, well, what if we use this technology and try to share rides? Okay. So in the US, uh, we have a lot of these microtrans. These things are called microtransit, these shuttles that basically move people either as a first class mile uh, service to transit or as an end-to-end -end service to move people in an area where there is no good transit access. Uh, there's been a lot of funding to try these things out, um, and you can think about it at the larger scale as an Uber shuttle, but uh, you know, mostly these things have been operating at a smaller scale in, in municipal areas. Um, now, what's going on with these pilots? There's a lot of these pilots happening, so what's the jury on whether this works or not? So it's unfortunately been mostly not so great, uh, and there are a bunch of reasons for this, so let's, let's talk about this a bit. So there have been many pilot deployments of various styles. I've been involved in two, one in the Seattle area uh, in, in a place called the Kent Valley, uh, and also in Chattanooga with the transit agency there, CARA. Most of these pilots have been small, public funded, short-term deployments. So problem number one is that you deploy something for six months. Uh, it takes about three months for people to figure out that it's, it's there, and then it's time for it to get shut down. So, you know, you're not going to change your travel behavior for something that you can use for three months, right? And in, in the case of Seattle, actually, the agency said, we're not going to be part of this unless we can figure out how to fund it for at least a year. So it actually ended up running for about 15 months. Uh, and then it got integrated into a uh, sort of region-wide uh, microtransit system. But, but this is a challenge, right? Because these are, and, and these are sort of ad hoc systems that are built upon the existing infrastructure. Um, and again, because of these reasons, there are generally low occupancy. Uh, there's not enough market thickness to make, make it really work uh, efficiently, also because of this. And then there's, again, limited int integration with the existing transit infrastructure, because in many cases, the existing transit infrastructure was not designed to work well with a microtransit system. Okay. 
And, and a fundamental issue here is actually um, the economics of it. Um, and there's, a, there's a reason why Uber and Lyft are not running pooling. Even, even pre-COVID, uh, there was limited Uber pool service. So they can't make money out of it. Uh, it is, you, if, you know, if you can remember trying to get a Uber pool pre-COVID, you would, you would probably get a, a Uber X for $12 and the Uber pool maybe is $10. And in many cases, and that's because you know that's how much it costs to run the service. There's, that's, it's hard to convince people to take a pool service uh, if you're not giving much of a discount. So this has to do with the fact that there's two things. So first thing is the uh, the cost of running a car with and without sharing. Uh, if there were congestion, if there was congestion pricing, and it would be actually much cheaper relatively to run the car with other passengers on board, it's more likely that these kinds of services would be viable economically. And the other thing is, with respect to microtransit services, is that running a 40-seater bus and a 10-seater shuttle, for the agency, the cost is not so different, because the labor, the driver, is the biggest uh, operating expense. Right? So again, if we had autonomous vehicles uh, in the transit space, then this scaling would be very different. Right? So, so here, there is really opportunity for both innovation, things, technologies like autonomous vehicles, and regulation, things like congestion pricing, to really change the landscape of the viability of these kinds of services. So, so the jury is still out of, on how, how this could or would work. And as of now, it's, it is a challenging area. But I think there is potential here. Okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, go ahead. I think a critical um, feature of a service uh, uh, which encourages pooling is the critical mass. There must be, so the problem is the transition, I think, from where we are today to a system that is efficient. And I think uh, the mass is so important. So I, I try to understand how we can move through the transition. Right, right, right. That's, well, that, that's a great point. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the adoption and how quickly people will adopt. And uh, I guess the... Biggest thing that could lead to adoption is, is I think, the cost uh, and availability, right? So, so investing in these kinds of services, even though in the short run they might not be profitable uh, and might require additional subsidies, and doing things like congestion pricing, which again changes the economics in favor of the viability of these things, uh, could help. Uh, but this is this is a tough question, right? I I, I don't have a good immediate answer, but the service needs to be available, if not, people won't use it, and needs to be economically viable. Um, and those, those are two, I think, necessary conditions, probably not sufficient. Uh, but but this, is a, this is a hard question. Yeah. So it, it implies that uh, it has to be subsidized for... for yeah, some absolutely. And, and also, get you, Carlos, but, uh, you know, transit and mobility in general is subsidized, right? There's even, you know, driving a car is heavily subsidized. So, it's not that we don't have subsidies in the system, it's the question of where the subsidy goes. Yeah, that's where I was going. It's not that you're subsidizing the pooling, it's that the, you're not pricing correctly the externalities of having a single occupancy car. Exactly, exactly. So, so that would be an, another thing that would have to be addressed. Yeah, great point. Okay, so, um, so what else can we do? Right? So I, I talked about the integration. Um, one of the things that I've been really interested in is understanding how we design from the bottom up a fully integrated mobility system. And so if you're in the city and you said, I could completely reconfigure my transit infrastructure. Now, of course, subway systems can't be redone, so I'm going to focus on buses. But if you go to some city and say, I'm going to give you the opportunity to completely reconfigure a bus system and add other components to it, how should you do it? What should that design look like and how do we compute that? And what does this really mean? Uh, so I'll sort of try to explain it in a picture here. Uh, you can think about some kind of multimodal transit system, which has this traditional fixed line transit, the kind of buses that we are used to. And combined with that, there is some set of services that I'll call con complementary modes, things like ride hailing, ride pooling, bike sharing, micro mobility, and micro transit. Right? So, so there's some mix of these services and these services. And the, 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 the premise is that if you were to do this, then you would improve things like energy efficiency, which, uh, which we care about, network, the network externalities induced by the system, and equity. 
And the hope is that you know, focusing on these kinds of mobility infrastructures will lead us to better outcomes in this space. Right? So, so that's the goal. Okay. And I'm going to focus on one of these components, which is the demand responsive transit. So you can think about that as being sort of Uber type services all the way to microtransit. So shared or non-shared. Okay. The question is, how do we design these systems? Now, of course, the first question might be, well, does demand responsive transit even help at all? Uh, the answer is it depends, right? So there are many factors that can drive whether or not uh, the demand responsive services is, is a viable thing. It could be a function of the network configuration, the origin destination patterns, uh, the relative cost of the two services, et cetera. Right? And, and, and we've tried to do some work in this area led by Carlos and Grazia, and uh, we have a TS paper on that if you're uh, more interested. But I'm not going to dive into that now. Um, now, if you were to operate such a system, that two fundamental questions. You, you decided that it's a viable thing. Now you want to actually op operationalize it. Uh, you need to efficiently operate the on-demand shuttles. Right? And this, I think, is a fairly well-studied problem in the OR transportation field. I, I would say that's not the biggest problem. I think we, we have very good ways of dealing with these um, routing large fleets in real time. We have companies that have very mature products in this space. So this is, I would say, not the hard thing to do. Um, what we have sort of less work in, I would say, is understanding how to design the transit infrastructure, given the fact that the transit infrastructure is now uh, being operated in conjunction with these services. Right? So for example, which route should be fixed? Uh, what frequencies should they operate at, et cetera. And, and that's what I'm going to focus uh, a bit on now. OK, so what is this? Uh, so we, we heard about the line planning problem a bit already. Uh, Anita mentioned it. I'm going to dive in a little bit more into specifically line planning. Uh, and so what is the problem here? Given a set of OD demands, so travel demands, find the set of bus routes and their corresponding frequencies that can serve as many trips as possible subject to some budget constraint. So there's a resource constraint. You can't run buses everywhere. You have a finite number of buses that you can run. Um, where should you operate them? Right? This is a very, very classical problem. Uh, I'm not going to talk about multimodal for a second. I'm going to talk about the standard vanilla line planning problem. OK. OK, so let's look at a, a simple model for this. So we have some network, which, uh, which is abstract in the city. Uh, we have buses that have some capacity C. And we say a bus operates some, some frequency F, so it could be five times hour, three times hour, et cetera. And a bus line is defined to be a combination of a route and frequency. So the CM blue route operating at frequency F1 is one line, and operating at frequency F2 would be a separate line. Right, those are two separate lines in this definition. Okay? And each line, of course, has a cost associated with that line. It could depend on the uh, distance and the frequency. Okay, so what would we like to do? We want to choose a set of lines and the assignment of passengers to lines such that it maximizes ridership. Now, again, maximizes ridership because that's, that's one definition. We'll get into whether this is the right thing to do. Uh, but in this problem formulation, what we want to do is maximize ridership. Okay. Uh, what are the constraints? Well, again, we have some budget B, uh, which we have to open these lines. And at most C, passengers can be on the bus at any edge, so which means the bus has a capacity C, and you can only put C people on the bus at any given time. Right? When someone gets off, someone can get on, but there's a capacity constraint. Um, in this first part, I'm going to make some other assumptions too. We're going to say there is no interbus transfers. Uh, of course, this is not true in a transit system. Uh, this can be relaxed. But uh, I'm going to first talk about a model in which we can have some theoretical guarantees, and then we'll go more into the real world. Okay. Okay. So first, I'm going to assume no interbus transfers. OK. So what does the model look like? So there are some uh, variables here. So XLP says there's a passenger set of passengers P and lines L. Um, XLP is a decision variable that says, do I assign passenger P to line L? Okay. It's a binary variable. And VLP is the value of assigning passenger P to line L. And if you are trying to maximize ridership, uh, VLP can be defined in the following way. 
it's one if passenger P can take line L and zero otherwise. And what does passenger P can take line L mean? That means if the line is, is something that can service their origin destination demand, it's close to your origin and close to your destination, then it can serve you. Otherwise, it can't, and then it's zero. Right? And this can be pre-processed right, for other lines, if you know the lines in advance. OK, there's another decision variable, y. Uh, YL says whether I should open line L. Now, if I open line L, I pay the price CL. Uh, and of course, summed over all the lines, this has to be less than the budget. And the next constraint is the capacity constraint. All it's saying is, for all the people who use edge, line, uh, use edge E on line L, uh, the number of people has to be less than the capacity uh, corrected for the frequency on that line. Okay. And then finally, you can't, you, there's this last constraint that says you can't serve the same person on two lines and get credit for that. Right? So very straightforward. OK, so this is a pretty simple model. Uh, can we solve it? So one of the problems here is that it's a hard problem because there are exponentially many lines to choose from. Right? The number of total bus lines in a network is exponential in the size of the network. So what can we do? Of course, for these kinds of problems, there's very classical things you can do in, in OR. Um, you can use things like column generation, branch and price. Uh, but turns out that uh, this is actually really challenging. Uh, um, sorry, this is really challenging because the pricing problem that gives you the set of lines is very hard to compute. Right? So, so there's been work. Uh, Ralph has worked on this for some time, and you know, there's some nice results that say that uh, if the lines are short relative to the size of the network, then you can do this very efficiently. Um, there's also some uh, recent work from Julia Yang and others uh, um, that, uh, that looked at this um, in, in, with a case study in Boston. Uh, but it's really challenging to do this at scale, even if you're not doing the multimodal, even if you're just doing it at the, uh, in the standard uh, uh, line planning context. So what's typically done uh, in practice is to assume a candidate set of lines. So there is some pre-processing step that you use to collect a candidate set of lines. So this could be the existing lines in the city. It could be polling the public to get um, a sense of what lines they want. It could be data-driven schemes that generate lines. Uh, you know, it, could, it could be pick your favorite ways to generate lines, put them all together, and now your optimization problem is to decide out of that pool of candidate lines which ones to pick given all of these constraints. Okay. Now, this also can be um, uh, a hard problem. Uh, part of the problem there is that the resulting integer linear program doesn't have a very strong LP relaxation. And another issue is that the number of candidate lines is actually has to be big if you don't know whether they're good lines. Right? Yeah, Carl. What is LP relaxation? Oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> Good question. So linear programming relaxation. Uh, so this is, if the linear programming relaxation of an integer linear program is tight, then in practice you can give it to a solver and it gives the answer quickly. When it's not so tight, then the solver has to work harder to find the solution. So typically, even if you have an ILP, an integer linear program, even though it's an MPI problem, you, it's not in practice hard if the, if the relaxation is is good. Uh, otherwise, in practice, it takes a long time. Great question. Thank you. So, so the problem, again, with the candidate lines is that since you don't, you're not picking them intelligently, so to speak, you might want to have a large set of candidates to be able to get a good solution. Right? So that, again, leads to a larger ILP than one in which you would craft the lines carefully using something like column generation. Okay. Okay. So, so this, is, uh, this is a challenge. So, so now, I, now I've only talked about the case without the multimodal aspect, right? So now I'm going to try to add the multimodal aspect in the simplest way possible. Um, so let's look at the, the problem then. Now the problem would be the same, except I'm going to say in conjunction with the demand responsive service, right? Okay, so now let's look at a very simple demand model again to incorporate the notion of the demand responsive service. So there is a passenger who wants to go from SP to DP. If they were to take a car to travel from SP to DP, they would take this route. Now, if you had a transit system, they could, and this bus existed, they could take this bus. If they took that bus and it didn't connect them end to end, they would have to take another, let's say, a demand responsive service here. And we can think about the savings in terms of vehicle miles reduced in the system due to the introduction of this bus line L. 
And we can say the value of adding value to that passenger of the existence of this line in terms of the number of vehicle miles traveled reduced is VP. Right? Okay. So this again, if you know the line, can be for each passenger pre-processed. Right? Okay. Once we have that... Right, so Lisa, what, why is it a value for this specific passenger of the vehicle miles reduced? So it's really per OD, right? So you could equivalent things. So for each origin destination, it would be the same, right? Uh, sorry, I'm, I might have missed something fundamentally. So, so understand completely why societally you want to reduce it. Also understand that if you have less congestion, you travel faster. I don't know if you consider this here. Uh, no, so there is no oh, congestion. There is no congestion effect in, in, okay, included okay. here. So, yeah. So what again is the benefit? I mean, the total. The benefit is, to society. Right. But you said it's a benefit for the person. No, no, benefit to society by that person taking this line. Uh, yeah, okay. thank you, thank you, yeah. So this is the benefit to the system, because now I'm a system designer trying to come up with the best set of transit lines. Uh, the benefit to the system by including this line is that this passenger is going to save to society this many miles, and, you know, cumulate, and then you add it up over all passengers, so take that line, yeah. Yeah, good question. Okay, so now if you were to use compute V using that function that I just described and solve this same problem, uh, if you maximize this quantity, what you're maximizing is the savings to society in terms of vehicle miles reduced. Okay. Now, of course, there is a limitation here. This has to be something that you pre-compute, which means it's exogenous to the model. Right. Now, in a real demand responsive system, the true cost of operating the system also has to do with the rebalancing, right? We talked about that in the beginning. This does not account for that, right? So this, this is a sort of a model where, let's say, the transit agency has a deal with Uber and says, the cost of uh, serving, I have a deal for each mile travel, I'm gonna pay you X dollars, and they want to see how much they can gain under that, uh, under that kind of model, then the cost is fixed. Uh, you can do that, but in, this does not, it is an exogenous model in terms of the rebalancing cost. Okay, so that's a limitation. Okay. Is the model, any other questions about the model? Yeah, Devansh. Uh, does it matter that the, that the C passengers per edge, uh, uh, that that's uh, edge independent? N no, it, it doesn't matter because what you really care about is, so you have to be consistent. So for each passenger's trip, you know which edges they take. But and you, all you need to make sure is that there are no more than C people who use the bus on a given edge, right? Uh, beyond that, there is, there is, because you're assigning passengers to lines, not edges. So there's no notion of transferring back and forth the other. Yeah. Good. Okay, so, so now the question is, well, again, can we come up with better ways to solve this? And I'm going to go into a... A uh, quick discussion on theoretical guarantees, and we'll come back out to the real world. The nice thing about this problem as formulated right now is that uh, you can give it some nice theoretical guarantees. This problem is actually very close to a uh, very standard problem that's called facility location. Um, and the only difference here is this constraint. So instead of assigning people to facilities, now we are assigning people to lines. Uh, when you assign a person to a facility, um, you know, it's the facility has a capacity, you assign it person, as long as you don't exceed the capacity, you're fine. Here, the capacity is at the edge level, so it's slightly different, right? And this actually m makes a big difference in terms of the mathematical structure of the problem. So there's a nice property called submodularity, which is this notion of diminishing returns, so, uh, to simplify it, uh, and that, that's broken in this setting. And you can't then use the standard machinery to, to solve this uh, with theoretical guarantees. But it turns out that uh, you can actually use a, another common trick that's used in, uh, in solving these kinds of problems, which is to take this problem and actually write an even bigger problem that's hard to solve, a bit counterintuitive. Uh, so instead of assigning passengers to lines, we can think about sets of passengers. Okay? So I'm going to think of all possible ways of combining passengers into groups. And I'm going to say, should I assign some set S to a line L? Now, of course, there are exponentially many sets of passengers, right? Uh, but it turns out that you can use column generation, uh, essentially, to come up with those sets in an efficient way. 
And once you do that, you can, uh, uh, you can basically solve the LP relaxation of this problem. And then you can use a technique called randomized rounding then to come up with an integer solution. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to just kind of not go into too much details on this, but I'm happy to go into uh, more discussion on the, on the technique uh, afterwards. So, so I'm going to skip through this, but for people who know the process, you, you basically solve the LP relaxation. You, you do randomized rounding based on the uh, fractional solutions that you get from the LP relaxation. Uh, and one important thing here is that since you are doing something that's randomized, the budget constraint is also only satisfied in expectation. Right? So you can do a few things. You can have a pseudo budget that's a little bit smaller than your real budget, and, and that you can use a parameter to describe, decide how much less than the budget, true budget you're going to put in the optimization problem. Uh, and then what you can do is since the, you know, once you have the solution to the linear program, the rounding, uh, the getting the integral solution is a matter of just kind of flipping coins. You're, you're just drawing random numbers and deciding which ones make in ones and zeros. This can be done very, very fast. So, so you can take this LP relaxation and come up with thousands of integer solutions. And these solutions will have a trade-off between the budget that it takes and the objective function value. So you can look at this plot of a thousand different solutions and pick your favorite one. Okay. The, the theoretical guarantee is, is uh, that the result from this algorithm is going to be 1 minus 1 over e minus epsilon of the optimal solution. And this is, this is basically the same kind of result you get in facility location. And this is budget respecting again with high probability. And you can actually quantify the probability there as well. Now you can, um, and of course epsilon gives you this trade-off. You can also do slightly more sophisticated things to make sure that the budget, it's always budget respecting, but you know, this is not very important practically. Okay. So let's go back to the real world, where we do <laughs> we, equations, <laughs> <the> real world. <laughs> but I, I do want to say that the, 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 kind of the theoretical guarantees, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to spend time going over the results, but I do want to say that the theoretical guarantees are relevant to the real world, and they are an important thing to try to do. Uh, because in practice, you might use your favorite heuristic to solve the problem, but if you have a theoretical guarantee, uh, it will either provide you a result that's better than your favorite heuristic scheme, which means, okay, great, use the approximation result, or your um, heuristic might give you a better result than what the approximation algorithm is telling you, in which case, great, you have a certificate saying that your heuristic solution is better than this certain theoretical guarantee. Right? And thirdly, the, the, uh, trying to develop theoretical guarantees might give you good intuitions about what the right heuristics to use are. So I, I think, you know, I don't want to downplay the value of, of the theory. It is really important. And uh, um, I, I think, you know, there are lots, lots of cases of where theoretical, proving theoretical guarantees have led to really important practical algorithms. Okay. But back to, yeah, Dimash. Do you know if 1 minus 1 over E is the best possible? I don't think so. Well, I mean, it's a, this is a generalization of a city location. So you'd have to go back to... I mean, it's certainly close enough to problems. I mean, it has more structure, and so it could be improved upon. But, but it, there are reasons to think it's, it's probably about what you could do. Yeah. <laughs> From the person who wrote the book, it's probably as best as you can do. So. <laughs> um, but good question. Um, OK, so we would like interbus transfers. We would like access to not have to assume a candidate set of lines. And, we would uh, like to make the on-demand service not be exogenous, right? So again, we can go back to these ideas of column generation, but the question is, how can we do it at scale for these large-scale problems? Uh, and how do we endogenize the cost of the on-demand service? Okay. Uh, this is ongoing work with uh, Neng John, who's here, and Okta Gunluck, who's at Cornell. Um, I'm going to so, so quickly sketch out the ideas. This is, again, unpublished work that we are working on right now. So I'll, I'll sketch it out uh, to give you a sort of sense of what we're trying to do. Uh, I'm not going to go into the optimization problem here, but the thing to, to take into account is that we are considering taxi circulation constraints. So we are, you know, the taxis have to go somewhere after they drop someone off to pick up the next person. There's a cost with that. We are trying to account for that cost. And we're trying to account for that cost in a sort of a macroscopic way. 
And uh, um, I'll motivate that also in the following sense. So these are planning problems where you design transit lines. Uh, the planning problem, the value of the, of the solution of a certain planning problem is dependent on the operational component. But the operational component includes data that we really don't know about now. Right? So we are planning a bus line for the next year. We don't know what's going to happen in three months at 3 o'clock at a certain intersection, how many people are going to need an on-demand service. Uh, so we are trying to estimate it, but we can't estimate it accurately. And the on-demand services themselves, their cost is highly dependent on small fluctuations in space and time in terms of the demand. So we, if, even if we want had the computational power to model this explicitly, it's not going to be a good idea. Right? So the idea is to model the operational component at an aggregate level and hope that gives us good information to do the planning properly. Okay, okay so that's the important thing. Uh, and, and what we're going to do is do some column generation on this model to get the candidate lines. Now, again, um, uh, the, the scale at which we are interested in solving this is, is the following. Uh, a bus network with 100 stations uh, and an on-demand service network of about 260 to 300 uh, nodes. Okay? And this is a case with about 1,600 OD pairs uh, um, and uh, 30,000 trips here. The number of trips is not so relevant. It's the number of OD pairs that matters for the scaling of the problem. So the right hail network are the shared shuttles? Yes. Sort of shooters. Right, so there are more nodes at which you can be picked up by the shared shuttle system than the bus network. Because in sparser areas, you don't want to run the bus network, but you still want people to be able to access the service. Right? So that's why there are more ride hail network nodes than there are bus network nodes. Also, computationally, it's much harder to scale up the bus network than it is to scale up the ride hail network. OK, so you can think about, um, uh, so let's look at some, some early numerical results. So you can think about a solution where, and again, sorry. So here, I'm looking at the version of this problem where trying, you're trying to find the minimum cost way to serve everyone, as opposed to fi finding out how to serve as many people with a given budget. Uh, uh, this is just for some implementation reasons, that's how we started. And so I'm going to show the results of that. Uh, if you had no buses, uh, you only had taxis, you would have a certain cost with the system. And clearly introducing bus lines helps. Right? And we've of course decided some cost ratio uh, per passenger using a bus is cheaper than the ride hail because you're sharing rides and you're uh, sharing the cost. Uh, the 26 existing lines in the, in the network uh, that we used leads to this solution. And what's, what's happening here is that the number of, we are increasing the number of lines in the candidate set through column generation. And one of the tricks we are trying to use to make this, speed up this process is to initially use very simple heuristics. So basically relax the capacity constraint in the problem so that you can quickly create some good lines and that actually getting more information about the system then helps us speed up the remaining part of the, because you get good dual prices. So then we kind of, you can see these, these kind of transitions happening. You, you go to a different kind of model to compute lines, and you keep doing that. And that's sort of. Sorry, here taxi is the same as the shared service. Yes, exactly. I'm just trying to get. Yeah, the, yeah. Yes. So just to be clear, so here everything is a taxi instead of shared shuttle. Um, you, if you go to a shared shuttle, then you'll have to rescale the cost. So, for this, it, I think it's easier to think of everything as being taxi, no sharing in this point in the model, right? So you are taking a taxi to the bus stop. Now you could use the same solution for a shuttle, but again, the operational cost of a shuttle, operational optimization of shuttles is much harder, harder than operational optimization of taxis. So we embed the operational optimization cost in this model. We use a taxi abstraction of a taxi system. You can scale, if you know that a per passenger cost of the taxi system is uh, versus the shuttle system, if you know that scaling, you can put that scaling factor here to adjust for that. But the, the model assumes that everything is a taxi, just because that makes the, the model sim tractable. Nikhil, did you have a question? Yeah. Should I think about the suboptimality of the existing lines as like the world has changed in OD? since like those lines are optimized or they're not taking into account taxi, like, like sort of 
what, what should I think about as causing that gap? Uh, uh, this one here? Yeah. Um, well, it's, yeah, different OD table, different budget. Uh, you know, again, this is, you know, this is not trying to serve everyone, right? The transit agency did not design the bus lines to serve everyone. So I, I think you should just ignore this. Uh, it, it's just kind of a benchmark uh, that is not super relevant, yeah. I think the more important benchmark might be this one, where here, uh, and I'll, I'll move forward one more here too. Um, and okay, one, one important thing is that we are limiting the system to five minutes for creating each column, each new line. So you have a five minute budget to create a line. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, I understand that you solve the pricing problem exactly every time. You could speed up uh, the solution by solving the pricing <coughs> problem heuristically, and if you want to prove uh, optimality, you just solve it uh, exactly at the end. Yes, so, so, so a lot of those things are happening behind the scenes. So what, the five minute limit is it's the exact pricing problem, a relaxation of the exact pricing problem is going to grow and being cut off at five minutes. Uh, now, of course, if you're going to do, it's still a lot, yeah, yeah. So we can play around with different things here. It's a trade-off between how good they are versus how fast. No, you don't need good uh, lines. Uh, sure, yeah. In fact, we are seeding with some really simple things to begin with as well. But of course, if you want to do this, really do this right, you would use some dynamic programming to solve the pricing problem. But still, uh, instead of things are fine, are fine. You, you, you need the exact solution just at the end. Right, exactly, uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and, and it, it is significantly so slower here than it is here. So these things are actually very, very fast at this point. The five minutes is really only becoming an issue out here. Yeah, that, but very good point, and yeah, that's a really important point. Okay, okay so, so this, the green is when you use, a, it's called random lines, but it's not really random. It's if you use a heuristic to generate the candidate set, um, uh, you can, and you get the 150 lines, you can be here. Uh, and of course, if you use, kind of do something more sensible with the column generation, and that's a, that's a big savings there. So 50% reduction in the cost, right? Okay. Um, and finally, in terms of the size of these problems, uh, these are fairly large problems. Now, so if you want to create 150 lines, the final, yeah, Carl. Related to this question, what does MIT mean? What did I miss? Yeah, okay, <laughs> mixed integer program. So it's again. Uh, what, is the number? what is these numbers suggest? These numbers. Oh, this, is, this is just the solution, the cost, the dollar cost of operating the system. So if you, if you only had taxes, it will cost you, again, the absolute number does not mean anything, just the relative difference between. It would cost you a lot. If you had a heuristic picking which bus lines to operate, you would have this cost. And if you use this kind of framework to compute which bus lines to construct, you would have this cost. And these problems are big. They're, they're of the you know, order of half a million to a million uh, continuous variables and the number of integer variables being equivalent to the number of uh, lines that you pick eventually. That's the final mixed integer program that you solve. And creating each line costs at most five minutes. In the beginning, it comes for pretty much free, and then it takes time. Right? So it, it takes a long time to solve these problems um, because this last program here this can take about four hours, and this can take about maybe 12 hours, but this is a planning problem that you solve once. Right. Okay. okay, so now let's talk about uh, fairness. Uh, I, I, this, this, this image might uh, raise a lot of discussion in it by itself, so, uh, so l l let's, let's start here. Uh, this is a, a picture from Jared Walker's book uh, on, on transit. Um, and the idea here is that you know, we have this city where each dot here is an intent for demand, a place in where there is demand, and there's a city that can run 18 buses. If the city wanted to maximize ridership, it would, oops, it would run the buses on the, these high-density corridors. Right? Because the bus would come often and the riders would utilize it. If you wanted to maximize coverage throughout the city, yeah. provide spatial access to every part of the city, these buses might run like this. Now, of course, the problem is that if you, if you design the buses like this, everybody has really poor service, right? Because the bus maybe comes once an hour, uh, and you, know, you get buses with uh, five people on a 40-seater bus because nobody's really using it. Right? And of course, if you, if you do this, the buses are full, but then what about people 
who are in these areas. Right? Now, of course, one idea is that things like uh, multimodal service with demand responsive components can try to get the best of both worlds. And again, it's, it's, you know, the jury is out on whether this can actually work, but that's the goal. And so this also leads to some discussion about fantasy as to you know, what, is our, what is our objective as society? What do we want to do? Right? And from, a, I guess, an algorithmic perspective, we can try to analyze what happens under these different situations and try to see whether we can compute optimal line configurations, for example, for different kinds of objective functions. And we talked about a lot of these objective functions uh, throughout, the, throughout the workshop. Right? So uh, we've been looking at this problem very recently in, in two different ways. So first of all, we've been thinking about from a really, really simple uh, stylized model perspective. This is uh, work with Alfredo Torico, who was here earlier in the week, uh, who's a research assistant professor at Cornell. Uh, this is sort of a very simple model, simpler than what Marco talked about a couple of days ago, which is a, a city where there is a city center at one and some suburbs at zero. Uh, and there's, you can operate one bus in the simplest setting, and it has a capacity. Um, and um, the, the population of the city is distributed as follows. It's a uniform population, but closer to the city center is a higher income community. And, and away from the city, you have more and more low-income people. Right? Again, this is one configuration. Uh, depending on how much budget you have, you can, you can either run, uh, if you have a budget of one, you can run a complete bus from the suburbs to the city and cover everyone. If you had a smaller budget, you could either decide to run a smaller bus all the way from the suburbs, uh, assuming that the bus cost now scales with this capacity of the bus, or you can run uh, a bigger bus from closer to the city center. Right? So, so you would, which means you would either serve more people uh, closer to the city center, or you would serve people all the way out here, but you would serve fewer people total. Right? Now this, and, and if you were to do this, uh, you would get something like this. So on the, on the x-axis here, sorry, the, the labels uh, disappeared here. On the x-axis, we have total ridership, and y-axis, we have the fraction of disadvantaged riders or low-income riders. And uh, the, the color here corresponds to um, uh, the budget. And the red and the blue line are the optimal solution for, for the maximizing ridership for a given budget and maximizing low-income ridership. So if you wanted to maximize ridership, as the budget increases, you would go along this curve like this. If you try to maximize low-income ridership, this would happen. For any fixed budget, you would be on this line. Like the policy space is the line. Right? You can pick any, it's a policy decision to pick any point in that line. Uh, so of course, what you say is if you try to have more low income riders, uh, you pay in terms of total ridership. Right? So the idea is can we construct some simple models in this form and maybe try to get some results in the, of the sort of nature of what Adam presented in his talk. Right? Can we sort of see in, in, are there phase transitions? Are there interesting? Are there, what are the fundamental trade-offs in terms of this notion of uh, some notion of equity uh, and uh, ridership? So uh, efficiency, equity trade-off. Right? Uh, so, so, so this is really early work, and I'm, I would be very interested in hearing any feedback that any of you have, uh, because eventually, of course, you know what we do, given the policy space, is a political decision. Right? So, so that's, that's sort of one, uh, one line of work that we are pursuing. The, so, uh, just to make sure, so this is a sketch. This is not the shape that is close to what you expect to happen in your No, no, this is simulation, real simulation oh, results. This is your, this is your shape? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, uh, again, some, again with, some, with this very simple model and linear cost. Uh, oh, with this? Okay, because yeah. you said you expect potentially to see a phase transition. No, no you won't see a phase transition in this simple model. You'll have to make it a little you bit more complex. In your, like in the real world. <laughs> or some, you, you, you some like, more complex stylization of the real world. I mean, there's, we have no chance of studying that in the real world, but you know, this model is too simple to see things that are too interesting. So, yeah. you know, so this is basically one spoke with uh, this kind of distribution. You can think about other distributions. You can think about multiple spokes. Uh, you, know, you can think about things where all the low-income people out here and all the high-income people. So when we play around with this, you quickly get very complicated pictures. This is, you know, uh, it's too early to really with confidence say much about any of that. But you can, you can change this 
with some very simple modifications and get much more complicated pictures here. Yeah, 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 thanks. The second line of work is to think about how we can incorporate notions of uh, equity into the actual real world line planning problem, not the stylized uh, uh, simple setting where we're trying to get insights, but the real problem. So this is, a, uh, we've been working for some time with, uh, with the um, uh, transit agency in Chattanooga and uh, Sophie had a post outside on some of this work. Uh, there's this question of, well, who should we prioritize? Who should the agency provide access to? And, and this is a sort of a, a schematic of something that came out from our discussion with the transit agency. So there's, there's this customer, Bob, who lives in Stens District 16, which is a low-income opportunity zone in Chattanooga. Bob wants to get to work, but has no car, so must take the bus. And then there's Sally, who lives in Stens District 7, which is a high-income area of Chattanooga. Uh, she works 15 minutes away from downtown, owns a car, can take public transit, but also can drive. Now the question is, do we treat the two of them separately? And the transit agency said, well, can we prioritize riders over one over another? Right? This is, we, we talked about this being one type of objective function that could be used to, uh, used to promote equity. And for these kinds of settings, um, it's actually quite easy, right? Because again, if you go to this kind of formulation, we have this notion of a value of serving a passenger. Uh, you can just change the value based on the group that they belong to. And all of the infrastructure in terms of the algorithms would remain the same. You could also do things like uh, uh, convex combinations of ridership and uh, disadvantaged group ridership. So, so there is this question of, again, also going back to what John described, the different types of models. From what models can we use off the shelf existing, the kinds of models that we are looking at, and for what kinds of models that incorporate equity do we, does it really break you know, our, our, our frameworks or make them much, much harder computationally? Uh, so this is, is, this is another line of work we are looking at, so how do we incorporate equity into these real world settings? First of all, understanding how, how we measure it and what we care about, and then how that, what the implications are algorithmically. And of course, you know, there are, this has been the theme of the entire week. There are many reasonable definitions, uh, maybe and some that are unreasonable, of fairness, corresponding to different societal goals and priorities. And each community might have its own priorities, right? So there is no one solution for every community, uh, resulting in different mathematical models and solution strategies. And at least in the transit space, our goal is to try to understand what are the important ones, and can we compute solutions for the ones that Know, the community is deemed to be important. And to do this, um, that's what I just said, so to do this, you know, uh, also given what uh, Celeste said, what we've really tried to do is go to the communities, uh, and we're working with Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, Chattanooga, as I mentioned, in Tennessee, and Wilson, North Carolina, which is a very small city, that, the town that does not even have a transit system. They have on-demand transit as their only service. Uh, to really understand from the communities what, what they care about, and then try to incorporate that into notions of equity over which we can uh, try to uh, design and operate transit systems. So I'll stop with that. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions.